Wait, where? What? Give me the box! Oh no. No, no! Not the box. This is the Escape the Zoo Podcast. With your host, Daniel Clark. Well, Keith, thank you so much for being a part of this. I'm obviously a huge fan, which is why I reached out and I'm really, really excited for this conversation. I just figured we'd start off with kind of talking about what a day in the life looks like. If you're going out on a guide, what, what's the process like? Yeah, I suppose if we, if we look at a day in the life of um, sort of maybe a private guide, private photographic li- guide like myself, um, we should look at what a day on safari looks like, I suppose. So um, generally, uh, the early morning starts are the way to go. Um, so w- we're getting up before the sun rises. You know, when it comes to photographers, we the, uh, as a species, photographers are probably the worst people on the planet. <laughs> um, we, we are so demanding and we are so impatient that, you know, any, uh, loss of light or any loss of opportunity is sacrilegious, you know? So <laughs> yeah. we're up. We're up uh, at the crack of dawn, literally, we, you know, before the sun comes up, depending on where you are, sometimes you get that allowance where you can go out in the dark and be where you need to be um, as the sun is coming up. Other places are a little bit more restrictive, so often it's when the sun comes up. So, But generally, you're ready to go um, get a good espresso in before the day starts, you mm-hmm. know, uh, dealing with people all day long. You can't be having... Uh, a non-coffee morning because I'm generally Trust me, I'm, I know a coffee, that. I'm a coffee guy, man. So you know, with me without my coffee, it's not a pleasant situation. Oh, uh, so. me too. I, I've like I'm on this kick where I started having like severe withdrawal symptoms if I wasn't having the same amount of coffee at the same times every single day. So I told myself yeah. I was I was gonna like cut cold turkey and then ease myself back in. And those no, that five sounds days horrific. after I cut cold turkey were the most miserable days I think I've ever <laughs> lived. I was like, it's weird. It's like I was like sad and depressed. And uh, I mean, I didn't get jack shit done either. It was just, it was. Yeah, brutal. you know, like I, I can sympathize completely. You know, um, I've gotten to extremes when it comes to, I can't just have an ordinary coffee. I've got to have good coffee and and being out in the wilderness, it's a, it's a challenge. So I've spent a great deal of money making sure that I can get my fix every morning. So that's a ritual. I've got just little hand, I don't know if you've seen them. They're like hand presser machines. You know, they look like bicycle pumps. Oh, God, uh, no. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, you, it's uh, it looks like a little uh, bicycle pump, and it comes with a whole kit. Um, so you can pressurize this little hand presser to give you the correct pressure for espresso. So without one of those, I'm essentially hopeless. So that's generally how Oh, my how God, that is, that's yeah. next level. That's intense, man. I've done videos on it and all kinds of things. Like, the, I feel like the public needs to be informed of these things. <laughs> <laughs> I think so, yeah, too. So. I mean, there's been times, like, especially camping trips and stuff, the amount of weight I have to put in my backpack just because I get the Starbucks espresso shots or something like that just because I would be miserably sick if I didn't have my coffee in the morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I sound uh, like a heroin addict, don't you? No, well, I mean, I, I, always, I actually refer to it as like a it was like a heroin withdrawal the first time that I tried to stop because I was literally, I had, I had had headaches, I had cold sweats, hot flashes. I like sat in a bathtub (laughs) for like a day. It was, it was brutal. Yeah. That, that's pretty severe. So yeah, back, back to the general progress of the day. That's the first port of call. Um, but then generally we're off and and we're out. Um, and uh, what I find, um, you know, I do two different types of guiding. Uh, private guiding is an experience based thing where you're going out and you're looking for the most amazing experience. Light is kind of secondary to that, but on a photographic trip, light is ultimate. So, uh, the first hour and the last hour of the day is generally chaotic. And I look like an absolute mess because, um, I used to call it good light psychosis. So (laughs) the lights, especially in the morning, it's, uh, it's a little bit harder because you have to literally find something in, and I'll be honest, there's about 10 minutes, right? 10 to 15 minutes where it's amazing. And then after that, it's good. And then it gets bad. But that 15 minutes, I'm a bit of a mess. So, you know, like charging around, trying to find something to put into that amazing light. And it doesn't have to be, 
you know, like big ticket items like lions or leopards or whatever. Anything in good light can be amazing. But, you know, those first 15 minutes are, are all go and then it generally gets a little bit better throughout the morning. And I, I tend to calm down as the <laughs> as the morning <laughs> progresses. And um, on, a, on a typical photographic uh guy that you're going out on are these people the same way are they are they professional-esque or are they kind of lay people like is it are they getting kind of all flustered too or that that first hour is just stressful for everybody yeah you don't meet too many um photographers at least serious hobbyists or semi-professionals or professionals who don't completely lose their shit um, <laughs> on the regular you know like that's uh, that's a fairly common occurrence you know like uh, i can i can spot the signs from a mile away you know especially when i've got a new client and uh, we're getting we're getting ready if there's any sort of delays i see the the sort of the twitches start to happen <laughs> and they're looking because they're looking at the sun and then they're looking at you and they're looking at the sun and they're looking at you and they're like right we need to get the yeah, hell going like, let's get What's going happening? man yeah so um yeah that's that's generally the case oh here here's my my goal oh, oh my god <laughs> And I come cause What's chaos here. Uh, uh, I've got two. This is Luna, um, and then I've got Vino as well. So oh very good laugh. It's so cute. Um, yeah, um, yeah. So I can I can spot them a mile away, but generally that's the case. People generally need to be out there, and you know that's what they're there for. So sure. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds very stressful. It's like you're, it can, you're, you're it waking up knowing that the first hour is just going to be the most intense and then it kind of chills out from there. Yeah, that's where it's at, you know. Um, uh, everything else is irrelevant. You can still create nice imagery and, and all that sort of stuff um, after the fact. But, uh, yeah, those that first 15 minutes. And in the afternoon, it's a little bit easier because uh, during the day you've got the lay of the land. So, for example, if you saw lions in the morning – um, they're not going to move anywhere, generally speaking. So, you know, you can go back there and then you can look for other things early afternoon, but you can be sure that they're still going to be sleeping when the light is good. So you've got an option. So it's easier in the afternoon right? and you don't, you don't have to lose your mind as much uh, sometimes. Do you ever remember like a perfect morning when you woke up and just the light hit and you found the perfect shot for your, for your, you know, there, crew. there's been so many, so many of those occasions, but, um, I mean, there's certain areas where, you know, like I'm a bit of a, like a backlighting addict. Like I just, I just can't resist dust and backlights. It's mm -hmm. my thing. Um, and there's certain areas like the Kalahari where it's just sublime. It's like you, the light in the morning is like something you can't even believe. And, and I'll often tell clients this and I'll say, listen, you don't understand, it's serious. When the light kicks off there um, and it's very dusty and you get this gold and red coming through and you get like silhouettes opportunities, it's, uh, yeah. it's mind blowing. So there's been a couple of situations where, uh, you know, that sun, it pops up over the dunes um, because often in the Kalahari, either you in a fossilized riverbed or um, you, you generally lower down. So you have to wait for that sun to pop up over the dunes mm -hmm. and then be able to position yourself in such a way that you can get the sun uh, semi in line with the subject and, and have that all happen at the same time. So, you know, generally I'm driving around or screaming at people, drive around trying to get things going so that you can get that shot. So, yeah, I'd say the Kalahari, it's nuts, man. Oh, my God, that sounds yeah. beautiful. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty awesome. How many days out of the year are you usually out there? Yeah, you know, I try and keep it uh, fairly reasonable. Um, I work on about uh, seven to nine trips a year, but sometimes I do um, do uh, longer trips where I'm away for a whole month, for example. Okay. Um, you know, sometimes with, with one group of people that we're away for a month. Um, so, I mean, if I had to guess, I would say maybe about 80 to 100. Okay. Uh, you know, the business end of this whole gig kind of keeps you busy for the rest of the time, you know, like post-production and marketing and all of the very exciting stuff. So how close do you live to the, to the animals? Are you in the city? Yeah. I mean, at the moment I've been in Abu Dhabi for three years. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I spend most of my life living uh, in, in, in the bush. Um, I was a lodge based guide. It's generally how this whole thing progresses. Um, and that's what I always wanted to be. So when, uh, I think I was about 19, 
did a course and then from there just went and, and moved to the bush and, and you work in the lodges. So you are employed by a lodge to guide people. Okay. And, and that's, and that's where you live, you know, you're there for a, for a month or six weeks at a time. And then you, you go on safari somewhere else when you have a holiday. Was that something you knew when you were a kid? Like, this is what I want to do, or was it something that more naturally developed? Yeah, I didn't even feel like it was an option, to be honest with you. It was the only one. It was the only thing that, I mean, I think ever since I could string a sentence together, that was that was pretty much it. There was no option. Uh, it was, you know, there was just such an affinity um, for, for, for nature um, that that was the case. You know, I think photography is, a, is an add-on to that. And, uh, and I always say I'm a guide first and a photographer second. So, you know, being able to, to just be out there is, is more important than anything else. You know, photography comes from, from emotion and you have to have that emotion with whatever you're photographing. Otherwise, your photography is just going to be right. you know, fairly flat. Um, so, yeah, for me, that's what it is. Do you feel a different sense of presence when you're doing the experience guided tours versus the photography ones? Or is it something where you can kind of blend the two just because it's so natural at this point? You can um, blend the two. I mean, for me personally, I can still be taking photographs during that whole uh, private guiding experience. But um, mm -hmm. often the case is uh, the privately guided, a more uh, uh, naturalist style of safari actually tends to suit me better because there isn't that pressure that exists to create these images. And, and often that's uh, self-born pressure um, right. because – you have to, you have no control. There's a wildlife photographer is one of these things, you know, you don't have, you can't set up your lighting in your studio and say, okay, you know, pose this way or pose that way. It, it's, there's a, there's certainly a lot of skill involved. It's very difficult wildlife photography as a, as a genre, but, uh, you know, you're relying on a lot of luck, um, uh, as well. So, but the pressure is there with a naturalist safari, you, you're just trying to create a memorable experience. You're just so, you know, you're taking things a little bit easier. Maybe you can take time to uh, enjoy a bit of birding or a bit of geology or botany or there's right. a whole series of things, you know. Um, yeah, no, photography for sure. is like, boom, get it, get it done. This is what it, the focus is. And yeah, exactly. You, for people who haven't been, can you give a sense of how vast of an area that you're typically exploring? Like when you go out in the morning, is it something where you're like, okay, I know there's going to be lions over here and giraffe over here in some sense, or is it, I'm just going yeah. on this vast landscape and crossing my fingers or, um, are you guys communicating yeah. with each other? It's, it's just hard. I think if you haven't been on so far to understand the scale at which, um, these, lands. yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, each, each safari is different. Each region of Africa is different. Each game reserve is just different, but generally speaking, um, uh, you have a area of operation, um, which could be anywhere from uh, 10,000 acres. I'll just put it in acres Yeah. and keep it North American, um, like 10,000 acres to 60,000 acres to 100,000 acres. Oh, wow. Um, but, and, and me personally, I, I'm not one for, for uh, cropped or manicured type of experiences. I tend to enjoy more of a wilderness experience. It makes it a little bit more difficult, obviously. Um, sure. But I prefer more of a wilderness type of authentic experience. And in that situation, um, you have the advantage of generally most of the time local guides with you or uh, in areas that I've previously guided um, that you have local knowledge. So you know um, the local guides in those areas generally have an idea of animal movements. You know, animals like lions have, uh, have territories which they maintain mm -hmm. um, and they can be physically tracked. So you, especially early in the morning, you're out early and off you go and you, you're on the roads and you're looking for signs of animals. So if you see lion tracks walking down the road, you follow those lion tracks. When the, when the lion tracks go off the road, uh, very often the local guides will get off the vehicle and track on foot until they find those animals. And depending on the area, then you could off-road, for example, to go and see those animals. Okay. Um, so there's a, there's a very subtle um, uh, dark art to, to, to finding these animals and creating these experiences, but it comes on the back of a, a great deal of, of experience. And are you able to, especially when you focus on more of these wilderness areas, kind of get away from people or is there a lot of guides kind of going out at the same time? Is it, do you still get that yeah, pretty wild experience? 
you that that pretty wild experience is available. Um, it's becoming less and less possible. Um, mm-hmm. And again, it depends because each area, each reserve is completely different. You know, um, if you are on a private safari in South Africa, for example, um, that experience is very, very carefully maintained. So they will only allow two vehicles and or three vehicles in a sighting. They're open game viewers. You're completely open to the animals. You off road, so you're getting a very close up experience. Um, if you look at an East African experience, you will be inundated with, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 vehicles at a time, and it can be very overwhelming. Yeah. Um, that's not, not generally the experience that I try to seek out. Those experiences are available, but you have to put yourself out there uh, either from a cost perspective or from a comfort perspective to be able to to access the areas that will give you those authentic wilderness feelings. To right. Yeah. Have you uh, have you ever had any scary moments on any of those, especially in the the open cars? <laughs> yeah, you know, like I think it's one of uh, you know having been having been doing this for twenty years, it's one of the most popular questions out there because I think people like to to have a sense of of how dangerous it is and and uh, and in in reality the the danger is is very 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 minimal. Um, uh, you, you're dealing with people that are trained and, and have a great deal of experience with danger, dangerous animals. But yes, you know, in, in the course of 20 years, there's been some fun ones. Yeah. Uh, certainly, you know, um, they aren't, I wouldn't say that they're in any way fun uh, and I never want to try and portray them as being, Oh, it was cool because we, we, you know, we had a life threatening situation. Generally, no, not at all. Are, I mean, <laughs> that's why I, and I wanted to clarify too. That's not something that that comes from, I, I talked to a lot of photographers who were dealing with grizzly bears and lions. And yeah. to me, the the interesting aspect of all of that is how to balance the fear that must be a part of it as well. It's it's definitely not from a desire to experience something like yeah. that. Yeah, and I think there's that misconception about that. And I think you hit the nail on the head. That they're, they're very, and if you have those experiences, you'll quickly realize there's absolutely no desire for them. But um, And also... Uh, Coming from a naturalist point of view, you don't want to be in a situation where you are instigating behavior um, that would lead to a, 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 a violent encounter or a, a dangerous encounter. You go out of your way to try and avoid those experiences. Sometimes right. it is unavoidable, of course. You know, you, you, you get yourself into a situation that was, that was completely unavoidable and then you have to deal with that situation. But uh, again, there's, there's so many ways to deal with situations that that don't have to end badly. And, and, and I would say... 99.9% of the time, that's 100% the case. And um, they make for good stories around a campfire, you know. Um, Can you give me uh, one of the point one? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I was just... <laughs> I was recently, I, I'm, I'm happy to clarify again that this is like a, not an, a frequent occurrence. And it's definitely not something that's desired because the truth is it's, it's for a number of reasons, right? It's like not only do you not want to put yourself in that dangerous situation, but you also just don't want to bother the animals. I mean, ideally you want to be away from them, but I would just imagine that yeah. after 20 years of doing something, there's an interesting story in there. Yeah, there more than one, I would say, but for sure, you know, they, I was actually just recently, um, uh, I had a, a potential client contact me and say, do you have some testimonials that I can get from other clients? And I gave him some email addresses and then obviously chatted to the to the clients to say to expect the email. And I got some replies back saying, oh, well, we won't mention this situation <laughs> happening. Then, you know? um, uh, and and there was two specific ones. One was sort of man-made, um, and the other was was a wildlife encounter. We were in minor pools in 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 Zimbabwe, and uh, which is a glorious area, you know. Um, and uh, the whole point of minor pools is to interact with animals on foot. Um, it's one of the few places in Africa where that's actually allowable. Right. So uh, I think it was our last morning on safari, we'd found an, a lovely bull elephant just before the sun was coming up, and I thought, okay, let's let's walk this animal. Um, so we, the, the elephant was asleep at the time, or at least dozing off. Um, so we'd managed to get into a good position behind a termite mound. Um, the wind was good. And, and generally in, in minor pools, you find that most of the animals are in, incredibly habituated to people walking around. In fact, scarily so. Um, but sometimes you get animals that come in from the uh, concessions that border on to, to minor pools and they might not have the the same sort of comfort levels. And right. this was the case that morning with this one elephant. And um, 
the elephant had woke, woken up and started walking across. Um, and it just picked up our movement behind the anthill. Um, and immediately you can see the change in behavior because most times uh, they won't even pay you any attention. And if they do, it's just sort of bluster. But mm. this guy picked us up and immediately came straight for us. Oh, jeez. Um, yeah, so I had to stick the clients behind a big tree on an embankment and knew that he was going to come. And, and very much when it comes with, with, with elephant, especially elephant bulls, elephant cows are a very a vastly different, and more scary proposition. But the bulls tend to be a lot about bluster. And if you behave in the correct way, um, you, you don't panic. Um, obviously, the, the standard rule of not running applies in most instances. Um, so once I tucked them behind the tree, I went out to meet the elephant head on. And he charged about four times, which is quite a surprise because you don't expect that sort of behavior in that area. Yeah, geez. Um, so a little bit of screaming and, and hat shaking. Uh, and after three or four recurrent charges, um, he'd decided, okay, it's, we weren't worth his while. And we watched him move off. And, and that was the end of that. But you know, uh, these are, are fairly com common occurrences and, and, and very comfortable to deal with. But if you were a, a client in that situation, you'll be like, wow, this is, that, that was intense, you know? Yeah. What, what was going through your head? Was that, I mean, on the fourth charge, was that, were you scared or were you kind of like, I know as long as I'm holding my ground, I'm doing okay here? There's always this weird level of, comf uh, of comfort. I think the more that you've experienced something like that, the more you kind of don't freak out. Um, but I've always found in dangerous situations, it's not necessarily you. It's almost like an out-of-body experience because you, you forget about yourself in that moment when you have other people to look after. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, when you have other people to look after, uh, you know, your reactions are very different. Um, and it's vastly more fearful than if you were on your own because of the, the, the consciousness of the other people involved. So Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And you, you had mentioned too, what was the other one? Yeah, that, the other one is quite a humorous one. Um, we, <laughs> we were, I had a, a, this same client um, who was deathly afraid of water. So we thought what a great idea it would be for her to go on a canoe trip down the Zambezi River, <laughs> <laughs> um, which she was on board, which is a great sport. Um, and we did that. It was, it's beautiful. You know, you, it's a very fast, fast flowing river and, and, you know, there's lots of crocs, crocs and hippos and, um, elephants crossing the river. It's fantastic. And you sort of just drift down. It's a very casual afternoon activity. You know, there's no real exertion involved and, mm -hmm. and naturally the same with safari everywhere. It ends with a gin and sonic, you know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so we, we were sliding down the river and we'd, uh, we'd parked up on a bank in the middle of the river. It was like a sandbank. Um, for some gin and tonics and we we started to pour our gin and tonics and behind us there was a um, some phragmites reed which is uh, i suppose similar to to um, like a papyrus if you if you want to compare it to something so very tall reeds you can't really see behind it and little did we know there was a there was a security operation going at that very same time to to catch uh, zambian poachers that were coming across the river to gill net fish um, in those wooden macoras you know the hollowed out boats so gill net fish. What does that mean? Yeah. So the gill nets is a is a uh, it's banned in 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 most uh, in most continents. Um, it's just a very very uh, sort of broad scale fishing technique where lots of fish get caught in the net and and it's uh, yeah, the, the the gaps in the in the nets are fairly shallow. So um, it's very frowned upon. Plus the, they were coming across the river onto the Zimbabwean side to catch the fish. So the the parks rangers had set up an ambush in the Phragmites reeds directly behind wow. our little lovely gin and tonic I actually sundown think spot. that they have a, um, I don't know if it's the exact same thing, but um, I was looking at Paul Nicklin's running a campaign right now because apparently California allows a, a very similar type of net that it's like the only, it's like strangely, California is usually so progressive compared to a lot yeah. of the United States, uh, the States. And it's just like this massive net that basically catches anything that comes through, including yeah, it's very marine right? mammals and stuff. And it's apparently like a very archaic thing, but is still allowed here. And they're putting a huge push to changing that. So I'm sure it's probably a little similar. Yeah, it's it's probably quite similar. It's a sort of freshwater thing generally. They, uh, I don't think they do too much in the in salt water, maybe like estuaries and whatever. Um, so anyway, this was all unbeknownst to us. We had no idea what was happening. So we just began our, our gin and tonic sipping and, and all of a sudden there was this burst of an outboard motor 
um, just really loud, and then screaming, followed by uh, I think it was about two or three gunshots. Okay. So immediately, like just dua dua, and because you have no idea of what's happening and you can't see what's happening. Um, we just assumed that it was uh, maybe a, a river guide. They, they carry revolvers to de- deter hippos because um, the hippos will come and tip the boat over oh, um, and cause chaos. Chaos, And then the guide will, will normally deter the hippo with the revolver. So that was our first um, impression about what was happening. Uh, but the outboard motor continued and the screaming got louder and louder and louder um, uh, and then I thought, well, okay, probably a good time to to beat a hasty retreat. So we sort of, we didn't pour our gin and tonics out, obviously. We kept going. <laughs> um, and we jumped in the canoe uh, and we started paddling back across the river to uh, where we were uh, camping, the campsite, uh, which is like a uh, an operation on the minor side, mm-hmm. uh, without having any idea what was happening. But while we were doing that, there was this burst of AK-47 fire. Um and the ricochets, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard of when a bullet hits water because I, it's a hard I surface. No. It ricochets off the top of the water um, and you hear it. It's a video. Um, so, and they had no idea we were there, obviously. So we were now paddling and this was happening. And uh, Oh, I thought they were firing at you. No, no, no. They'd caught the, the, the poachers um, and the, what we didn't know any of this, obviously. So yeah. we paddled back to, to the, the camp and then the, the camp had sent someone out to come and collect us because they thought they were, we were involved with some hippo incident or whatever. And then only later we found out the story. And what had happened was that they were circling around the Mokoru, mm-hmm. making sure that they didn't escape. The one guy bailed out of the water and started swimming to the bank, and they were shooting to get him to stop. Um, so that was the AK-47 fire that we were hearing. Oh, my um, God. That's so we got terrifying. back and we had no idea what was happening. Yeah. and But the guests, I mean, I'm, the guests were, were, were completely – unaware of anything that was happening and the risk involved and whatever. And we got back to the, and then we found out what had happened and we finished our gin and tonics on the bank. So <laughs> yeah. hey, I there's mean, always these, at the end of the day, they have probably one of the more interesting stories to tell at dinner parties. Exactly. So, so this came back to, to this testimonial and then she was like, ah, oh, I think we'll probably leave those <laughs> few little tidbits out, the of the, out of the testimony. Fire out of <laughs> yeah. the, the testimony. Gun, gunfights on the Zambezi river. So yeah, um, always something interesting. But from a wildlife perspective, loads and loads of very, very interesting situations. When you um, uh, when you're working at a lodge and you uh, and you're a lodge based guide, you're tracking animals on foot daily. It's uh, it's just you're out there eight hours a day doing this. So you inevitably are going to stumble across things. Like I've almost stood on leopards three or four times where they've literally just dropped down into the grass and you have no idea that they're there. Because uh, they're practically invisible, and you put your foot down right next to them, and they just <clears throat> and then run off, oh and my you God. absolutely shit yourself because you've got no idea. You're looking for a leopard, but you don't realize it's going to be under your foot. And when you stand up next to it, it bolts off one way, and you you crap yourself hard. Yeah, it's better um, than coming at you. <laughs> yeah, you know, I have a few friends that that's happened to, but um, really, yeah, 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 just same sorts of situations. Come away with a battle scar. Uh, yeah. I'm um, sure that won't be a pretty one. So w- when you do these guided tours, are they typically like you have your your standard ones that you do every year or do you do custom tours too? Yeah, I mainly do bespoke tours. Uh, so um, majority of what I do is, is bespoke. It's custom style stuff. It's someone that wants to go and explore a specific area to get specific images or just to go and enjoy it. Um, and then we'll recommend the lodges and the areas to go to in those specific countries. Uh, and then the other ones uh, tend to be a more longer overland type of experience where we'll go through three or four different countries and and spend three weeks to four weeks just going through all of the parks that we can while we're there. Oh, that's cool. So it's not like a, like a one day type thing. You become pretty intimately involved with like the people that you're guiding. It's more of like a, a friendship level, I would imagine at that point. Absolutely. You know, um, uh, the normal, the normal trip wouldn't be less than seven days. Um, so anywhere from seven to 10 would be normal. Um, and then I, I've quite uniquely tend to do these longer trips. Um, so at the end of it, you're either the best of friends or the worst of enemies kind of deal. So, yeah. um, yeah. 
so, you know, four weeks with, with, with people you don't know is, um, is an interesting prospect, but, um, it's often uh, in very, very real authentic environments and you really do make some great friendships. Do you have a, a go-to spot in Africa? That's your, your favorite. Like if somebody wants to do a tour, then you just like your ears perk up and you're just super excited to do it. Yeah, you know, there's there's special areas. There's special areas everywhere. And I think one of the things that I try to inf- emphasize a lot is is that each place has its very unique calling card, its unique uh, selling point that draws you back all of the time. And there's some areas for me personally that are more special than others. And I think um, potentially the uh, that bots like Botswana for me it, it epitomizes the 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 top of safari excellence. Um, it's uh, such a unique country uh, in so many ways, and just the your access to to true wilderness and wildlife experiences is really hard to beat. Um, so for me, I'd say Botswana is a really special uh, destination. But there's so many, you know, there's so many. Each place I could rattle on endlessly about, um, but I think, yeah, immediately that's the first one that comes to mind. And uh, is there? one photo or one experience that you've had in Botswana that was like, you just knew in the moment that this was something that you don't get to experience too often, or it was just like a very special moment. Yeah. I mean, there's been lots of those. I think, um, there's been wildlife sightings that I've had with incredible clients and guests that's, that have just blown, blown the socks off everybody that was involved. There's been other instances where I've been out on my own doing reckeys of areas or, you know, I often try to go out, uh, once a year, um, on my own, because when I'm with clients, uh, and guests, they, they're getting priority. Um, and I'm, uh, instructing them and giving them the best position. So I often like to go out once a year on my own so that I can get myself into those positions and get some decent photos. So there's been a couple of instances like that, but if I think back, um, just last year, for example, there was one specific sighting that was just absolutely mind-blowing um it's a place in botswana called naipans or naipans mm-hmm. um, and uh it's well known for a resident pride of lions and and they just happen to have uh maybe 10 week old cubs um that had just rejoined the pride and they were there at the water hole practically every day and the sun was setting and it was just sort of absolutely red dusty 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 cool. black backlit red um, wow. just complete light insanity. Um, and out came this lioness with her two cubs and we'd followed them all the way down. They were heading towards the pan for a drink. Um, and the pan is very busy at that time of year because it's the only water source. So it's just inundated with wildlife, but elephants love it as well at that specific time of year. Mm-hmm. So as the sun was just poking down and that it was in that last 10 minutes of just outrageous light, um, that was the mother and two cubs and the cubs started drinking and there was an elephant bull directly behind them and he was throwing dust. He was throwing pink and red dust all over himself. Just completely nonplussed by any of the lions drinking. The lions were drinking. The cubs then began to play with the tail of the mother. So biting the tail and then the one (laughs) cub had the cub's tail and the cubs had the mother's tail and the whole time (laughs) this elephant was just walking and throwing dust and carrying on. And, and that whole process went on for about, I think the video I took was about six or seven minutes. Um, and it's one of those where you just like, that's just absolutely worth every bit of effort that you took to, to do this oh, whole thing. Oh my it just God. makes it all worthwhile, you know? Can I find um, that online? Yeah. Yeah. I just posted a video today on Facebook uh, with clips, certain clips of that. Oh, awesome. Video. I'll link that in the yeah. show notes. Cause that sounds yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah, go for it. So, um, there, there was a few, I mean, uh, today I did a, a sort of, um, my year in review type of video and, and another just absolutely incredible experience from last year was, um, in, in Mashatu in Botswana, which is on the South African border, um, uh, Southeastern side of Botswana, there's, uh, a game reserve called Mashatu game reserve, but there is a company that runs underground hides. Um, so it's a specifically designed underground hide. So it's a shipping container that is essentially sunk into the ground. Okay. So you are at eye level to the waterhole, um, and it's specifically uh, south-facing, so you get both afternoon and morning lights. And right. 
Um, it's well established and there's been some incredible photos from that hide. If you if you just Google Matsaboli hide or Mashatu, those images will come up. Some of them have won BBC Wildlife Photographer of the Year. Really? With Greg the Toy, yeah. And there's some incredible images, won many, many awards out of that hide. Um, so I was there with, with guests and clients last year and uh, uh, it was fairly quiet. It was fairly early in the dry season and we weren't expecting very much. But every morning there's this collection of guinea fowl. I don't know if you know what guinea fowl are. No. They're sort of um, chicken-looking, chicken-sized birds uh, that spend most of their time on the ground, and they congregate in these big groups. They're kind of spotted um, uh, and dark-colored, uh, but they gather in the mornings. And because it's so dusty, they kick up all of this dust. So there was, uh, I reckon, in easily in excess of 300 to 400 guinea fowl sitting in front of this. Oh my hole. god! The sun was coming up, so they were kicking up all of this dust. So it just creates this like enchanting atmosphere it's completely red and dusty and beautiful and, and we weren't expecting anything more than that and at one stage i looked up and i, I just saw this curled white tail in the middle of the guinea fowl just completely in the middle of the guinea fowl wow. and i was like i couldn't believe what i was seeing so i took a double take and immediately recognized what it was and it was a mother leopard with two cubs walking directly through the middle of 300 to 400, what? screaming, panicking. And when they uh, when they panic and start to alarm call, the guinea fowl make a racket. Um, and this whole time, the, all of the dust that they kicked up is, you know, adding to this whole thing. Yeah. Um, so they just walk and the guinea fowl sort of park like the Red Sea like that. And, and in they troop through the middle of the guinea fowl with the two cubs. And they have no idea we're there. Um, so they were going to come up for a drink, but then they, they generally it's an unheard of. There's, I think, been two or three instances of leopards coming to drink at that hide. And this is, you know, just one of these freak, fantastic opportunities. Oh, my and, God. Uh, so they just walked in. I've heard the thing that you can't if you if you start to shoot, the, the shutter click will alert them. And an office, often they're a bit skittish, so they they disappear off and they, so you you wait until that absolute last minute before you fire off the shots so i was just sitting videoing this whole thing completely amazed by what was happening in front of me and then eventually they picked us up and, and ran off um but i don't think anyone said anything for like five minutes afterwards maybe just completely just spell what the hell man what just yeah. happened yeah that was just so they'll, they'll pick up that little click of a of a digital camera yeah, yeah, no, they'll and they they can see you. Obviously, they can. It's dark, but they can definitely see you. But they, you know, they'll wait for a sound and then they'll be like, okay, you, there's people in there. And until they get used to that, they they'll completely run away. They're, they're not comfortable with it. Oh my god, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. do the do the leopard cubs like? I know one of the the really hard things with cheetahs right now is that there's a very very high cub mortality rate. I think it's like over 80 percent something insane um yeah do you know if it's similar with leopards it's similar with with all of the cats even even lions um you know the there's such uh, intrinsic competition between predators in africa and in india as well you see it with tiger cubs it's the same sort of thing um the the competition and it's not just competition so it's uh, not just a species uh, different species competing. It's not lions killing cheetah and leopards, but it's also lions killing lions, leopards killing leopards, and cheetahs killing cheetahs. Right. Uh, because there's the the need for males to completely um, uh, or charge and, and bring in their genetics into in, in, in that's their whole reason for existence. So they will actively go out, look for cubs, kill them in order to breed with females um, and and get their genes out there. Um, mm. So the majority of of uh, cub mortalities is actually from that same specific species, but really? they're such fragile things. Yeah. Yeah. The majority of, of, of most, um, cub mortalities, lions, leopards, cheetahs, uh, is from their own species, but they're such fragile little things, you know, they're, you know, they're born completely useless, blind, um, they have to be carried around their mother. So mm -hmm. anything will, will take a match, you know, like a snake, a bird of prey, a hyena, buffalo, elephant, uh, just absolutely anything. So yeah, the, the mortality is incredibly high. Yeah. They say too, that now, like with some of the populations getting as low as they are, that you can actually pinpoint like individual mothers who are just the best at taking care of their cubs. And you have to desperately do everything you can to not lose those mothers because their survival rate of their cubs are like 10 times more than your standard. 
Yeah, there's some exceptional cases like that, and I, th- I think it's uh, there's there's another aspect to that as as well, which is quite fascinating. But um, you know, th- there's one uh, famous example in in the Mass Amara of Malaika. Malaika is the mother cheetah, and and she'd never lost a cub, um, and she'd ever. routinely. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure if it is ever. I can't wow. can't validate that. But as far as I understand it, mm-hmm. uh, that's the case. She's a supreme mother, um, and she would have five a litter of five cubs and bring all five to adulthood, which is unheard of. Right, um, wow. You know, she's in a unique environment there that's ideally suited to cheetah, but there's still a great deal of lion presence there. It's a very, very high lion density. So the risk to her, as well as leopards and, and all the other things that are to kill cheetah cubs, um, to be able to do that is exceptional. And I think recently she just passed away. She um, well, she hasn't been heard of anyway for a, for a month or so, which is which is unusual. I think she might have drowned crossing a, a swollen river, but she just brought her last cubs up to adulthood um, again. I think it was four cubs. Um, so those sorts of exceptional stories are amazing. But, um, you know, when it comes to to wildlife areas that are well traversed and, and full of tourists, these animals become part of your life. Uh, when when I was working in, in the Sabi Sands, we have a very, very personal relationship with the leopards there. We know the specific leopards. I can take one look at a leopard. Even in photos now from 10 years back, I can look at a photo and say, it's that leopard. Really? That's her cub. Yeah. There's a whole lineage that gets followed. And there's whole Facebook groups, man. It's, it's actually quite insane. There's, there's a whole online social media frenzy about um, specific uh, leopards, their progeny, their whole lineage, lions, where they originated from, which lions are in control of which areas. Um, no and they follow it daily from the from the social media posts and things like Safari Live and and, and their webcams and it's it's a big thing like you, it it'll actually shock you if you if you go into it but one of the things is is that um, uh, as guides you want uh, for example a female leopard to bring up female cubs because males tend to disappear off right so you know right. even if it's if you have a very relaxed female leopard that will come and lie in the shade of your vehicle and you could park underneath a tree that completely oblivious, which is a general sort of uh, thing that you can expect in some areas in South Africa. They've had so much um, uh, time with with safari vehicles and, and human presence that they're completely relaxed and play, pay, pay us no mind. That's gold, the safari operation. So if you've got a relaxed female, the cubs will then in turn generally be very easily habituated to people over the time because you're seeing them every day. Right. Um, so if you can get a female that has female progeny, you, you're going to win because the females will either take a part of her territory or not move very far to to try and maintain a, and, and gain a territory. So then you have access to that female and her uh. comes to be habituated. So there's a whole lineage. Some of the lineages in, in the Sabi Sands goes go back 40 or 50 years. Um, where there was a habituated leopard and that the lineage can be traced back from the modern leopards all the way back to, to one specific female or two specific females. Oh, my God. Females. Which I think yeah. even probably plays into um, that ultimate mother, Cheetah. I'm sure that her female yeah. cubs probably have some instinctual thing where they're going to be better going forward about taking care of their own too. So. It's exactly. I mean, it's. I don't think it's any different to uh, to to humankind in in that good mothers beget good mothers. I suppose in the way. And um, yeah, when it comes to to big cats, that's definitely the case. Do you ever um, experience any like poaching situations? Not necessarily going on, but like just like sad sights when you're out out and about there. I've had some unfortunate instances um, in my career as a lodge guide, certainly. And as one of the driving forces, I, I don't think you can, you can do what I do or be passionate about things and be a naturalist without being aware of these things and encountering them. Um, you know, I, I have such an affinity for, for rhino projects and, and like Margot's book that we, I know we talked about, um, previously. Yeah, I actually just um, talked to, uh, we talked yesterday. So yeah, yeah, for no, anybody listening that hasn't like bought that and, remembering rhinos yet, please do. Yeah, absolutely. Such a great initiative and, and remembering wildlife in general. But uh, it comes from a from a history with me. Um, uh, I've I've seen and, and and been affected by by rhino poaching personally. And it comes down to this thing again, where uh, local guides in a specific area will get to know specific animals. Again, white rhinos are generally fairly uh, territorial. 
Um, they maintain an area. You expect to see them in those areas. So you're seeing these animals every day. You get to know them. You get to know personalities. You you, you get a real affinity with specific animals. Um, and I was in the Eastern Cape. There's a famous uh, um, case of, of rhino poaching down there. And um, Tembi was the rhino that was named. So while I was there, uh, there was three rhinos poached overnight. Um, uh, and uh, a colleague of mine was on game drive and found the poached rhino. So what they do in the Eastern Cape in South Africa is, is they actually overdose. They use uh, veterinary uh, sedatives, things like M99, mm -hmm. uh, things like that to overdose rhinos because rhinos have a very low tolerance for, for sedatives. So they, they dart them as opposed to shoot them and then theoretically overdose the animal, kill it, and, and then take its horn. Um, but with this specific case, the animal, one, one rhino was, was dead on arrival. Um, the other two were actually still alive. So they'd taken the horns off and when they take the horns off, they take the growth plates and everything. So they're basically getting down to the sinus level because they won't leave any Ugh. small amount of rhino horn. So they hack it off with a, with a machete essentially. And two of the rhinos, um, were alive, uh, when they were found. And um, it was a boy and a, and a girl, and the girl was Tembi. Um, the, 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 the male was a, was a sub-adult, and the female uh, was an adult. Um, and, and she became known as Tembi. And it's one of the most heart-rendering, heart-wrenching experiences I've ever been through in my life. You know, uh, you're so personally affected by it because as soon as it happened, the, the treatment that goes into to repairing that. So we'd managed to keep the, the, the male alive for about 30 days. Um, the female is still alive, reproducing fantastic success. Really? Yeah. Um, it's really, it's an on, online sensation. Um, it's, a, it's such a, a huge win for, for uh, rhino conservation. And um, so what actually happens is that you have to treat this. And while this was happening, there was no real veterinary um program for how to deal with these sorts of injuries. So they had to invent it as they go. And there's some incredible individuals um, uh, like Johan Maria from Saving the Survivors and Dr. William Folds. Mm -hmm. um, and Dr. William Folds was actually the guy who was involved. And you have to pay out of pocket for these treatments. And these rhinos need a treatment every second day. And when you treat rhinos, you have to dart them. When you dart them, you have to get a helicopter up. Um, the, vet the, the veterinary expenses are incredibly high. The drugs are, uh, are very expensive. So you have to dart the animal. We had to clean out the wound because obviously it was going to get infected. It was completely open to the sinuses. They were doing medicated tar, all kinds of craziness. Um, wow. So we were literally, and you give them fluids and uh, IV antibiotics every second day. So these rhinos were getting treated every second day. We were, uh, did a whole bunch of fundraising and got a lot of funds coming in. Um, and, and that's what we essentially did. The, the vets would come in and we would assist on the ground every single day, essentially, to treat these two animals. The, the, the male, unfortunately, he, he was injured in the leg and his leg got septic and then he passed away from that after about 30 days. But then the, the female Tembi, she became almost the poster child for, for rhino poaching in South Africa. And um, she continued on. She has subsequently, I think, had two calves um, and this reserve, Damn. which is just absolutely phenomenal. Um, and uh, she carries on her life like normal, which is just amazing. Wow. That is very shocking. That, that took a much yeah. different turn than I was expecting it to. Yeah. And, and that's really sad because isn't it true that you don't even actually have to, like, couldn't they just sedate the rhinos and cut off the horns? And They could, could but again, it's a, it's an issue of them not wanting to leave. That's very valuable. I mean, it's, it's more valuable than, than cocaine. I think I don't want to be I'm not up to date with the actual prices of everything at the moment, but um, at one stage they were saying it was more valuable uh, per gram than than cocaine or heroin. Um, so uh, if you if you cut a rhino's horn off, it's like your it's like your cuticle on your fingernail. Mm -hmm. You can't take your whole fingernail off. It's exactly the same material as you know. It's just a keratin based. Um, uh, it's essentially compressed hair, but you can't take your whole fingernail, and that's the same with with rhino horn. Um, up to a certain point, there's a lot of blood vessels and nerves. Um, so when they, they do dehorn rhino, they normally leave a fair chunk um, mm. that they can't take. A, a rhino poacher is obviously uh, not going to do that. They're going to come in and take the whole thing. I recently that, um, watched the documentary Trophy. Have you seen it? No, I, I, I do battle to watch things like that. Um, yeah. I, I, will, I will bring myself to do it, obviously. Um, but it takes a lot of uh, 
urging for yeah, me to do it. Things yeah. like, you know, like watching Virunga for me, like Virunga. Oh, you've God, seen Virunga? yeah. Ah, it's like absolutely bawling my eyes out watching that crap, you know, like a, it's it's so unbelievable what these people are doing to to conserve that area. So it takes me a lot to to view these things, but I will. So trophy is. Yeah, is well, I was going to to go on Virunga for a second. The um, I mean, I think they just recently, like, a week or two ago had a, like a handful of those rangers were were killed out in in uh, Virunga National Park yeah there um, was uh, six there was five rangers and a driver that were that were killed uh, last week i think uh, i think like when you talk about like sacrifice for conservation i think Virunga there's literally nowhere else in the world where those i mean they're going to war every day for those gorillas and protecting that park well there's one specific organization that I'll happily talk about. And, um, so African Parks is a NGO. It's a nonprofit organization that um, that manages. They have management contracts with, uh, I think they're on about 10 million hectares of under management. Maybe I stand to be corrected on the exact numbers, but a great deal of, of high-risk African parks are managed by African Parks. And again, it's uh, it's all donor-funded. Um, so very wealthy individuals donate uh money and then uh, African parks uh, take a contract with that specific government to manage these parks. And some of them, uh, like Virunga, uh, Garumba, which is essentially a war zone, um, uh, and that's in the Congo as well. Um, Garumba, uh, Zakuma, which is in Chad, uh, they run a few less less high risk, but still fairly challenging areas like Lalongwe, mm-hmm. um, Vajeti. Uh, Liwa Plains. So they're constantly always adding to their portfolio. But what they do is they go in there with a very military mindset. They train local rangers. Uh, some wildlife in here. <laughs> um, uh, they train local rangers uh, and they go in and turn around in the most unbelievably amazing way, turn around a completely drastic situation into conservation success stories. Um, they They use military tactics um, and and general common sense conservation initiatives to completely, completely turn around these very, very high risk areas. Um, and it's a revelation, you know, one of the most uh, emotionally charged visits I've ever had is to Zakuma where you, you go and see the front, you don't often get to see that, you know, when you're traveling to these places, but you go to Zakuma and you get to see the sacrifice that people have made, they've got the plaques of the rangers who have died in, in gun battles with, with poachers. Right. You get to see the, the control room where they are managing every single elephant on that reserve. They know where they are. There's flights flying above them. They've got reaction teams. They've got horseback teams. They've got mumbo really? teams with snipers. Um, they've got – it's it's an incredible, incredible operation um, that is very, very intelligently managed. Uh, so they, they – from all of the doom and gloom, I know we've kind of gone dark here a little bit, um, yeah. but all of the doom and gloom that we're talking about, there is just as many stories of incredible individuals and organizations that are out there doing just the most fantastic work um, to save these areas. So that's that's a positive. Yeah, and it, it's showing that technology and like, or just even a better understanding of tactics to go into these areas that are so troubled are starting to come around. I mean, absolutely. There's no, there's no lost cause. Um, you know, there's, there's dedicated people out there that, that can turn things around and, and organizations that are able to do so. So definitely don't think there's any lost causes. out there. No, definitely. But the reason I brought up trophy was, um, back on the rhino side of things is, one of the gentlemen that was highlighted is John Hume, who I'm not sure if you know, but yeah. he, uh, yeah. essentially for listeners, he is a guy who essentially farms rhinos, has about, I think, a couple thousand of them. But, but yeah, don't quote the, me on is that. The, he's the biggest private owner of r- rhinos in the world. He has a great deal, uh, and, it's, and it's certainly in the thousands, yeah. And it, it was a weird... Um, it was a weird thing to watch because he does care about his rhinos deeply and he harvests the horns without actually killing the rhinos. He just sedates them and, and cuts them off. And there was the argument as to whether what he was doing was a philanthropic thing or a, a bad thing. And um, it, you could kind of go both ways on it because it legitimizes a, a black market, which you would yeah. think would have uh some bad consequences, but he was also pointing to, he was making the argument that when they banned 
rhino horn in South Africa that poaching actually went up, which I thought was mm. kind of odd. So I was just wondering if you had, and I don't know if that's true or not, because I talked to Margo about that yesterday and she, she didn't think that was true. But yeah. anyways, I was just wondering so, if you had any perspective on it. Because for me, I was kind of torn. I was like, here's a guy who's yep. protecting with millions of dollars, thousands of rhinos, but there's also some weird financial backing to all of it. Yeah, you know, um, I think when it comes to any one of these debates, uh, it's the same with anything. There's no black or white. There's a whole bunch of complexity and gray in the middle that takes a lot of sifting through. Um, There's a lot going on with the rhino argument, uh, pro-trade, anti-trade, and it's so, so uh, complex internationally. Uh, what's driving the the demand and these sorts of things, you know. Um, the bottom line is is that uh, something needs to be done with regard to the whole problem and taking a one-dimensional approach to it, saying, oh, we're going to protect our rhinos is not a viable option. It's an option and it's a very, very, very crucial one. And absolutely everything needs to be done to protect existing rhinos. But there needs to be a more broad scale, subtle approach to doing everything. So there needs to be the protection of the rhinos. There needs to be the management of the rhinos. There needs to be the relocation of rhinos to safe spaces, like the uh, various initiatives going into Botswana, from South Africa to Botswana to safe areas. There needs to be a political, governmental, worldwide change in thinking as to what's happening. There needs to be the addressing of the demand, where the demand comes from, how to manage that demand, how to educate uh, young people in those countries as to the the fallacy of rhino horn. And uh, on the topic, you know, the, the trade in, in lion bones or the trade in bear bile or um, the ornamental trade in ivory, all of these things, although very different in their, in their subtleties, hold true that the the biggest issue is the demand side and you know um there's so many arguments and there's so so mired in controversy uh, controversy when it comes to which is the right way and i don't think there is necessarily a black and a white answer to this there's certainly a lot of subtlety and there's a lot of approaches that need to be taken um the legalization of rhino horn i don't believe is correct i don't believe that we can as as a uh a species that is trying to to save these animals. There cannot be no a, a logical situation where we are actively selling rhino horn because Africa being Africa, uh, the complexity in trying to uh, to manage that situation. One of the biggest issues prior to to a rhino horn ban was the loopholes in getting uh, rhinos, rhino horns out of country and to be legitimate. And a lot of it was hunting organizations. And and those loopholes are very, very, you can just Google it, you'll see all of the, the disasters that happen. And any situation where there's going to be a legal trade in rhino uh, horns or any animal products, there's going to be uh, bureaucratic nightmares and loopholes that people will just jump through. And, right. and that's my personal belief. So I don't, um, um, I, I understand the John Hume arguments. I've I've been back and forth on this issue so many, so many times and, and on all of these issues. But personally, I don't see the sustainable utilization of, of rhinos being the answer because already you've seen uh, exports of rhinos to China where they're creating these rhino farms. And, and that's not a good thing. It can't be a good thing. These animals need to be in Africa. They need to be protected where they are uh, naturally found. Their numbers need to be bolstered. The, the, the existing numbers need to be maintained and we can't risk losing any rhinos. Um, and right. the, you know, the argument is sustainable utilization, but, but that comes with its own problems and uh, corruption and, and, and loopholes and, and potential disasters. So, yeah, that's my, my opinion on the whole thing. No, I think it's a good point. And I think it also shows how non-one-dimensional these, these solutions have to be. I mean, I, I mean, I'm sure a lot of these areas... It, it, there's economic things that have to do with it too, where uh, I think, especially in some of the Western countries, it's really hard to imagine like who could kill an elephant or who could kill a rhino. And I think when you live in some of these impoverished places where some of the poaching does come from, like that's another angle that needs to be looked at into Indeed, as well. Yeah. Um, Conservation is a very, very complex thing. And um, 
Uh, I always say to people, whenever this topic comes up and we're talking about it openly and honestly, I say, you know what, the biggest issue is and the biggest cracks, or, or um, what's the word, crutch uh, of, of getting involved in these arguments is if you bring a Western mentality to any of these arguments, you're already on the hind foot because you don't have an understanding of what the people that are actually perpetrating these crimes are living with. Right. And essentially, they're just as much the victims as the animals are because um, – to a certain extent, don't get me wrong, but to a certain extent, uh, you know, you're living in a, in a poor village in, in the border of South Africa in Mozambique and uh, you have no idea where your next meal is going to come from. Uh, these sorts of things become very lucrative and attractive and it's very hard to, to combat those things. And they are doing it effectively, you know. Um, the South African um, anti-poaching situation is starting to see results um, from the education, from the intelligence operations, from all of these things that are happening in Mozambique. So it's very difficult to to come into this argument with a, with a strictly Western mindset saying, oh, you know, from an emotional perspective, how we don't understand how anyone could, could kill another animal, especially a really endangered one. Um, it's, it's vastly more complicated than that. Yeah, it's, um, it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Have you ever seen that? Where it's like, yeah, yeah. For if, if your food and shelter aren't being met in it, it becomes a lot less easy to uh, start thinking about the emotional um, or, yeah, or, or compassionate angle with, when it comes to these animals. Obviously, you should still. I mean, I'm not making excuses by any stretch of the imagination, but I think it's just so much more complicated and, and the, the solutions are so much more multi pronged than I think people make it out to be sometimes. Yeah, I mean, you can never uh, you can never simplify something like this. They are the most vastly complicated things to deal with in the world, and my and I have the utmost respect for anybody trying to to do something about it um, on either end of the of the argument. You know, um, some I feel like someone like John Hume probably gets persecuted more than he should. Um, you know, uh, maybe his intentions are, are good. I don't know the guy. I can't speak for his personality right. or whatever. But from the general impression, like you say. That seems to be the case. Um, so persecuting the guy is not going to help the situation. Yeah, and I, I think I think that's something. In I'm not trying to go on a tangent here, but just to touch on that quickly, I think we've gotten into this culture of persecuting ideologies that we don't agree with in a way that further backs people into corners, and then they start acting like any animal that's backed into a corner. They just kind of lash out, and a lot of these things, like bringing up the conversation, regardless of if you how you feel about the person's mentality is, is more important yeah. to have the conversation, the discussion and figure it out than just continue to um, try and persecute these people who you don't agree with. Yeah, hundred percent. There's a lot of really bad examples where people have gone into things with, with nothing but the best intentions, but have no idea what they're dealing with. Um, you know, there's the example of the white lion situation. And I don't know if you know anything about that. I don't think so. No. So, um, the existence of white lions is, is solely a South African thing, and it's solely a regional thing that was uh, found in on the the western um, boundary of the Kruger National Park, where where the it's essentially a recessive gene um, in lion populations in that area, where a tawny lioness would have a litter of uh, four cubs or three cubs, and two of them would be tawny, and one of them would be white, completely, completely white. Wow. Um, but it's essentially a recessive gene. It's not albinism. Um, it's called leucism. So it's just a, yeah. It's kind of like the, the of, spirit bears in, in the exactly, great exactly, like it's a, exactly what leucism is. And um, so because it's so iconic, because it's, it's, wow, it's a white line, people then go ahead and make the wrong assumptions. You know, the, the fact that it is a recessive gene, if it was a positive positively recessive gene, then that gene would have taken hold and, and, and benefited the animal in some way. The fact is that it's generally not because a, a white lion tends to stand out and very few of them survive to adulthood because they will get killed by other lions. Um, so it, it's very difficult for them to, for that recessive gene to take hold and carry on. Um, but now what has happened is people have come in with a, with a completely wrong idea thinking this is, this is something that needs to be protected. Right. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to have these captive. And since the value of these lines have gone through the roof, because as a hunter, a hunter might want to come in and have and shoot a, a, a white lion. So there's been this whole thing for many, many years of breeding white lions, some of them for the purpose of conservation of these animals, other for the purpose of hunting these animals, because it's a unique trophy. Right. Um, 
but the the bottom line of this whole thing is is that if you're trying to conserve something that's a recessive gene that's not going to benefit those lines in the first place, you're not doing the right thing. Um, you you're never going to reintroduce these animals into the wild if they're bred in captivity. That is never going to happen. Right. Those animals don't have the capabilities to deal with the wild. It's not like rehabilitating a cheetah, for example. A lion is a very very different scenario. You can take a rhino. Um, that's born in captivity and re-release it, but you can't generally do it. And I say Is that just almost. largely because of like predatorial instincts? Yes, absolutely. Predatorial instincts. You could, you can, uh, a lion or any predator can be taught to kill itself and, and find its own food, but it doesn't have the wherewithal to be able to uh, survive because lions are born into prides. Mm-hmm. And those prides then protect each other. They're very territorial. If a, right. uh, a pride sees another pride, they're going to fight and they're going to kill each other. Male lions move off. Male lions kill each other. They kill other lions. They kill all of these other things. A single lion, um, the only way it can work is when you've got a closed system where you bring in these lions into a closed system. They don't have any other lions to deal with um, and they, they're they brought in as a, as a pride group or whatever the case is. Then that's the exception to the rule. Mm-hmm. But it's never going to happen that they're going to be uh, brought and reintroduced into the wild holistically in a wilderness area. It's not going to happen. So again, these people have come in with this great intention uh, of trying to conserve something that's unique without a full understanding of, of the ecology of all of it. Um, uh, and, and that causes problems in itself. So that's a big issue. And, and so much funding has gone into, into these sorts of things, you know, um, right. yeah, it's just unfortunate. And when you have limited funding, you want to really make sure that you're putting it to, to good uses. There's, there's lots of things out there that, uh, that would benefit from that money for sure. Well, let's, uh, I'll try and get back into a lighter tone. Of, <laughs> no, I mean, it's important and, it, and it's, and it's interesting, but, um, it, it, I think it's just like the, the key takeaway is that these things are complex in Absolutely. I think it's important to like to address them. I mean, I think in general, it seems like you have somewhat of an optimistic outlook towards how things are changing in Africa. Is that me stepping too far? But I mean, just just based on kind of uh, talking about some of the success stories. Yeah, you know, I think, um, <laughs> yeah, it is, it's a tough one. It's a tough one for me to say 100% I'm optimistic because it's very difficult to deal with um, – with the, the fallbacks and the, and the setbacks to conservation. Um, but if you don't have optimism, then what do you have? You've got nothing. So you, you, you've got to remain optimistic. You've got to do what you can do and, and, and try and support what you can support. And, and that's all you can do, I suppose. Yeah, that's it. This is kind of another negative thing, but it's worth talking about on this. But um, <laughs> That's another yeah, interesting, very negative podcast we're having here. No, I mean, I don't think. It, I mean, I think it's interesting that whole white, well, yeah. I, the whole white lion thing to me. I'd never heard before. I thought that was amazing. Yeah. Um, but I, I just think, like, when when you look at conservation in general, like the fallbacks are so important to look at because just because of how a lot of these species evolved, it's really interesting. When I was talking to Tony Wu, who he does a lot of underwater uh, cetacean photography, and also fish too. And there's these weird like phenomenon that go on in the natural world where 90% of populations will meet up for this particular spawning event or go like, I know in, in Hawaii, the, I think it's the green sea turtles. Yeah. A hundred percent of the population goes to one Island, like this really remote Island and and lays their eggs or, or breeds. I forget exactly what it was specifically, but when you have these, even if the numbers might seem good, if all of their existence is based on being able to congregate in one area, one, it's just very risky when that happens. But if it's one habitat, then if anything happens to that island, who knows what's going to happen to a species overnight? Um, it's just interesting. I mean, but you just kind of spark my mind with the fallback side of things where yeah, it's, it's hard to get optimistic when you know that those realities exist and you kind of have to continuously be fighting. Yeah, I, I think it's very easy to get disheartened, um, and I think it's fine to get disheartened. I think the important thing is is that maybe just do something, like just something. Whatever it is for you or whatever blows your skirt up, whatever you're passionate about, just do a little something. That's, I mean, more you can't ask, I don't think. Yeah, I think that's a good yeah. 
that's a good point and a good one to to move into more of the fun things. I want to talk yeah. a little bit about the the wildebeest migration, which I've seen in some photographs that you've had. Okay, um, I've yeah. always just imagined that that would be an absolutely mind blowing experience to to be a part of, can or just to witness. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, it's it's. <sighs> They call it the greatest wildlife show on earth, right? So it, it has to be it has to be pretty good, right? Um, <laughs> you know, they, it's such an interesting thing. Um, just the ebb and flow of that migration in itself is, is is a topic for conversation. You know, just how that whole thing has evolved, where it's evolved, why the migration happens in that specific area, the perfect environment for that to happen, the correct grass type, the correct environment, the correct soil type, the correct uh, climate, the climate, everything is just it's this perfect place for wildebeest who are specifically adapted to eat that specific grass. They've got the right mouth parts, everything, it's just perfect. Um, and what it's culminated in, and, and no thanks to ourselves as, uh, ourselves as well, is we've had an impact on on the numbers of these wildebeest coming through and, uh, you know, uh, the, the ebb and flow of the ecosystem and, and the ecology of that area just creates this absolutely insane wildlife show, um, of which the noise is the most spectacular thing you've ever heard of. Uh, it's just, it's deafening um, to hear the panic. I think the panic is, is what, if you go and, and go to the, Mara, the, the Mara River mm -hmm. and sit there and watch these crossings, you're taken by the absolute panic in the mothers. So, you know, you, you see wildebeest too, kind of renowned for not being the smartest things in the world. Right. They'll go to a specific crossing and they might wait there for a day or two days deciding whether they will cross or they won't cross or, and some of them try and then they come back or, and then it just takes a certain amount of uh, energy and number of wildebeest to go in for them all to commit and they all go. And then it just turns into absolute chaos. So they just wow. cruise across this Mara River with all of these crocodiles chilling on the side, just snapping at them. They like they're in, they're breaking their legs on the rocks trying to get across, and it's just uh. absolute carnage. Uh, the zebras are coming in behind them, and then once they get up onto the other bank, they get up onto the other bank, and obviously in all of the confusion, the mothers have lost their calves because that's the whole process of the migration. So the wildebeest are, are chasing the rains and the short grass, um, and they have to move around. Uh, north to south, east to west in those regions to chase that rainfall and the specific type of grass that's going to aid them in their, in their birthing process. So they come all the way down to the south of the, of the Serengeti, Nunadutu, to have, their, to have their calves and then all the way back following the rains. Wow. So on their return journey, going that way as well, um, but let's just focus on their return journey. You've got all of these calves that are now crossing the river and in all of the confusion, the mothers don't know where their calves are. So they all cross onto the river and you've got a um, herd of four, five, 6,000 wildebeest on one side. You've got 6,000 wildebeest on this side and you've got 1,000 in the river crossing or more and no one knows where anyone is. So they're just <laughs> leeting and screaming their heads off and trying to figure out what's happening and, and the noise is just, it's just, the most outstanding aspect of the whole thing. I wonder how many uh, moms end up picking up their own calves and spending yeah, they're like, all right, you, you'll do. <laughs> yeah, I'll take you're, you instead. Yeah, you look, you look good enough. Come along. <laughs> but you so, know, the, the animals are it's so remarkable how they imprint on, on their parents. You know, like a, a newborn zebra will, once it's born, will circle its mother um, and they take in, they imprint, same as uh, birds do, like ducks or geese, they imprint on their parents. So with a zebra, they're a very specific shoulder pattern and, and the mothers will. And it's amazing to watch. They'll cross this river and they will find each other. In the throngs of wildebeest and zebra, they will find their mother that or is they crazy. will find their calf. Yeah, it's insane. It's really insane. I remember watching, I forget what movie it was, some kid's movie when I was like eight years old about a duck that was born and imprinted on the first thing I saw, which was yeah. a human and yeah, followed yeah. it around. Yeah. And I watched the entire movie being the most jealous person in the entire world. <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> you, want a, you want a duck to imprint on you? I know. I just like hung around uh, at the ponds know, Deborah, for the rest of the day, <laughs> rest of the year, just trying to find a duck hatching to imprint yeah. on me. Go to, go to the, go to the park, wait at the lake, try and find <laughs> some baby ducks. The, I, um, somebody has to have done that in the world. I, I'm sure that, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's not an uncommon thing for, for baby zebras to imprint on vehicles. Oh, really? So, yeah, you know, uh, sometimes in, in the confusion or maybe the mother is, is left the little one and whatever has happened, the zebra will come across a, a, a vehicle and then imprint on that vehicle and it, they will literally follow that vehicle around 
thinking that it's his mother and that sort of thing happens. He's just like, That's bizarre. Right, you're my mom now. <laughs> and so See where this goes. With, with the wildebeest migration, do they know if it's, is it an instinctual thing where they're headed or can they smell where the grasses are? Yeah, they can absolutely smell the rain. And it's such an amazing thing to actually witness because, um, so the majority of the, the rains fall on, on the Western side. Uh, let me just get my bearings right there. So, uh, the Northwest of the Serengeti and the Mara triangle is generally where the majority of the rains would fall in say August, um, September, in and around that that region, but it's a fairly vast area, so you can imagine that it's not just a a broad sense of let's go to the northwest. They will move in that region if there is a rainstorm. So they will see and smell the rain from kilometers and kilometers away, and they will move their course. So if the herd is going this way, or a large herd, or the vast majority of the herd is going in one specific direction, and there's some rain locally five kilometers. Uh, in, in a different direction. They will all change their course and go in that specific direction really? because that rain starts the, the short grass and then they'll feed on the short grass. Then if it rains somewhere else, they'll follow that rain. So they completely smell the rain um, from miles and miles around. Wow, that's and crazy. And which way to go. But it's specific to, because of the climate in those regions, it's all climate related. So it's the the longer term weather that causes the specific um, climates in that area, right? So the, the, the northwest um, parts of these parks tends to be wetter than the northeast, for example. So it's very unlikely that the wildebeest would go that way because traditionally it's there. So there's a, there's a corridor that the wildebeest tend to follow, but it's fairly wide. Um, and then they automatically follow the rains back down and then they, they come down for their calving, which is in March and in Dutu in the southern Serengeti, which is again, fairly wide area. They must hate the Mara River. Do you think they're ever just like, this would be I, such an absolute cruise of a migration if it wasn't for this one yeah. damn river. And like, God damn it, these crocodiles <laughs> snapping handbags in the river. They're like, oh, enough with this noise. Do, is it, I, don't know, I, I don't know if I give wildebeest enough credit for that. Though. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's... I, maybe I'm being harsh. Maybe I'm being harsh on wildebeest. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Is it is it something where a lot of them get picked off in that river, or is it like the vast majority get across? It's just one or something. Two? You know, like the, the I always hate like in in the modern age, I always hate like throwing numbers out there. And you say <laughs> it's oh, the no, worst. You can't you can't act 13, like an expert in anything. Yeah, because even if you're right, there's a statistic that says you're wrong somewhere online. Yeah, you're, you're gonna know someone sitting at home going, I'm googling that right now. <laughs> So, um, but you're talking in the region of, of every Mara crossing, um, you know, or, or during the major season, uh, seasons of the crossings, thousands upon thousands of these animals, um, get swept away. Uh, they get injured. They can't get out the river. They get stuck and eaten. Um, so with the, the preponderance of this mass migration of herbivores and, and food sources, this massive like protein, uh, procession. <laughs> so essentially what it is it's a, it's a procession of protein right with it comes this bonanza for predators and it's just a complete bonanza so um on a on a micro level we're talking about the importance of the wildebeest deaths in the health of the Mara river ecosystem so lots of the animals uh, that that pass away in those crossings, then become of that become part of that ecosystem. So when their bodies break down, the health of the Mara River ecosystem is very very much benefited from all of that um, decaying matter that goes into the river. So right. aside from things that get eaten by the crocodiles um, and the hyenas on the banks, um, you know the the, the catfish, um, all of these sorts of things, and it and it plays to the to to the health of the the whole ecosystem. So it's an essential part of it. But thousands upon thousands don't make it. But that's the nature of the of the migration. Yeah, is yeah. there a is there a similar phenomenon or even a, a unexpected animal? Like if you were to say like there's something in Africa that most like most people default to lions and elephants. Is there a, a phenomenon or a specific animal that would be more unexpected that is one of your favorites? Yeah, I mean, there's so many, you know, like uh, it's very easy to to fall in love with a big ticket animal, you know. Um, uh, but for me personally, I think uh, elephants are a, a, a constant fascination. Their intelligence, their uh, nature, their emotions, their 
communications, just everything about elephants is just so ultimately fascinating. Like you just can't beat them for for fascination. But if you look into any situation, like um, the the political um, uh, wranglings of chimpanzees, for example, that's I mean, hundreds of books have been written about it. Oh um, yeah, so Gold has decided that uh, it's now time for a wrestle right next to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So if you look at uh, just that alone, that that's hundreds of books have been written about, it and that's so vastly interesting. So, um, from a naturalist point of point of view, if you are a, a natural born naturalist, everything is fascinating, like True. absolutely everything. And you can find the interest, and the more that you find out about something uh, large, the more chance and opportunity there is to find out something really cool about smaller animals, um, tiles, insects. Um, birds is, uh, you know, the, the, the list is endless. Um, but as far as a personal, um, affinity elephants for me, just spending time with elephants is the most therapeutic thing on the planet. There can be no one in the world that spent time with elephants that hasn't gone away with and said, you know what? I feel a little bit better today after that. Really? Yeah. That, yeah. that's always been a big one for me. Yeah. I've been really wanting to go to the David Sheldrick orphanage and check out. The yeah. And guys. you know, she has such a, a sad day in conservation that she just passed away last week. Yeah, so. I know. I saw that. I mean, yeah. absolute titan in the conservation world. Yeah. It's these sorts of people that give you so much hope, you know. Um, and and one of the things that I, that I thought about talking about today is just um, the uniqueness of these personalities. You know, like uh, the people that I've met in doing what I do have been not only the most interesting of people, like you can just have endless conversations and never be bored or, or let down by the converse, conversation, but also just the most incredible human beings. And it and it seems to pull people together. So, you know, all you look at all the icons like Jane Goodall and, and all of these people, underneath all of these icons are thousands of people of exactly the same nature that are busting their butts every day, doing amazing things for little to no reward. And it's just amazing. And to a man, these are the most interesting people on, on the planet for me. Yeah, I think that's 100% uh, <laughs> one of the reasons I started this podcast is you, you talk to the, anybody that I came across through doing any type of wildlife work, just the good natured and the the desire to see a better world and help out other, not only other people, but other species, I think is a, is a unique thing that comes in the conservation world. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's, uh, there's some incredible people out there and you know, you, you meet them all the time. The other thing too, yeah. is they're not sitting not in a cubicle from nine to five. So they're not, uh, <laughs> they're not, they, I think, I think they don't have quite as downtrodden as a thing as sometimes you see in some of these big urban areas. Yeah. Cause they're, probably living a life that they're meant to a little bit more. Yeah. I think, uh, I mean, if you open yourself up to nature, it's very difficult to, um, to go back. Um, you know, like now I'm living in, in, in an Abu Dhabi, which is essentially a city where we moving, I'm moving to you to Kampala in Uganda in June. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Um, but, uh, when you take someone that is relies on nature, uh, out of nature, it's a very unnatural situation. So, you, you know, I see it with, with lots of people that, you know, you, you don't exist in the city. You, you're not a city mouse. You need to be, need to be outdoors. Yeah, I even have noticed that I grew up um, on uh, Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, if I go more than a week or two without seeing the ocean, I can, like, intensely feel, like, this anxiety, like, coming over me. And it's like... I just got to go get that. Uh, you got to get the fix. Got to get the fix and then I'm good to go. Yeah, I have, uh, uh, I mean, if it's if it's three or four weeks without it, I start to, I need to, to go out and, and just get that little little nature injection and then back to, what's the, back to uh, the grindstone. What's the catalyst for the move to Uganda? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, just being back in Africa, I think, is, uh, is huge. It's such an amazing area. Um, it, it's part of East Africa, even though it's, it's fairly central. Um, but it's in the middle of everything. Like, uh, 
it's 600 k's from from the Masai Mara Serengeti ecosystem. It's uh, chimps and gorillas around the corner. You've got amazing wilderness in Kadopa National Park, and uh, you've got the source of the Nile. You've got mountains, birds, uh, rainforests, highlands, snow. Everything. Just gen- just general nature madness. So I think that's just the driving force behind getting out there. And it's a lifestyle thing. I think um, uh, when you when you do similar things or you have or you have a similar mindset to to having to be out there, you need a lifestyle. You need to, life is not worth living. Life is not worth living without um, a great lifestyle. Being outdoors and enjoying things and seeing beautiful colors at sunset and um, communing with animals, all of these things are important. And when you don't have it, yeah. Yeah, you feel What's it. What's the point of that? Yeah. <laughs> I saw, no point in it. I saw uh, on another side that you saw, you climbed Kilimanjaro. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? How it, that's something that's always been on my bucket list. You know, um, I think it's a very, very surprising um, endeavor. Like it's something that uh, maybe surprises people just how good it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think as an African... Absolutely every African should at one stage in their life go climb that mountain because the, 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 there's something about it that's, that just speaks to you. It speaks to everybody, obviously, but uh, as an African, I think it is really special. And um, it's, it's, it's very busy um, in relative terms to, to climbing other mountains like Meru or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but just the the experience of being at the top of Africa and the beauty of it and the, and the emotional experience, I think it's it's really so worth it. Um, it's such a fantastic experience. Yeah, it, it's. I feel like climbing mountains is always. I did um, Mount Fuji last year in Japan. Yeah, and it's it's that such, looks crazy, huh? So oh my amazing. god, the crazy thing about Fuji is the way that it, we set it up is you climb. And you almost do like 85% of it in a day. And then you stay in this, it's literally just like a wooden hut, uh, about 15% up from the top where they give you like a microwave. 15,000 people in there. Yeah, literally. Like I slept <laughs> in a bed. It was my girlfriend and I, and we were lucky because we were on the top bunk and only slept with another couple. The bed below us, I think wow. had 15 people on it. It's just like a that's, long. It's that's intimate, man. And then on the in the main room, it's just a floor that they put like mats down and it probably fit 40 people. So it's probably realistically That's 75 people in like 800 square feet. But anyways, Yowzes. but I, I did have a window view and the view was unbelievable. But anyways, they give you this meal and it's like a, like a microwave meal, but you're just exhausted because you've been hiking up the whole day. But what's yeah, cool yeah. about it is that you wake up at like three thirty in the morning. Everybody puts their headlamps on, and you, all you can see for the last like yeah. thousand feet or or whatever it is is just a row of headlights, and it's yeah, it's awesome. gorgeous. And then you get to the top and get to see the sunrise come up, and just the whole experience about how odd it was to be sleeping with that many p- people I didn't know, and and like <laughs> being strangers. experiencing that sunrise in the morning was just like an, an unbelievable experience. But similarly to Kilimanjaro, it's, it's, I would imagine how I feel with climbing mountains is it's it's something where in the moment on the way up, there's it's something you've always wanted to do, but it's just like, you're like, why the hell am I doing this? It's, like, it's yeah, so yeah, tiring it's, I mean, it's, and it's, it's like it's, it's such an effort, but the easy. accomplishment of getting to the top and the walk down is just always The walk down it. is by far the worst. Like, really? oh my God, that's seriously like uh, the, the last, uh, your last big day, not the last morning, but certainly when you, you summit and you walk all the way back down, um, that's a day. It's a proper day. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's totally worth it. Uh, you would absolutely love it. Um, it's nothing like Mount Fuji. Um, when I say it's busy, there's like maybe there's 300 other people on the mountain because you're going up. It's not just a single exercise. You don't just take your backpack and and you, you've got a whole team that takes you up. So you, right. know, you can have anywhere from 20 to 30 people carrying your stuff. Um, so, and then setting up this camp and whatever. And, um, but what's nice about Kilimanjaro is, is that you, you're spending time. So you get to enjoy, it's a leisurely walk. You're not, you know, you're taking very, very slow walk. Um, each day is sort of like between four and six hours, just casual right. walking. You walk through rainforest, you walk through Alpine region, 
um, you know, uh, the heather region. Uh, it's and it's all beautiful, and it, everything is just beautiful, and you have the time to just enjoy it. You, I mean, when you're walking, you're essentially walking on your own, you know, with your group. You're encountering other people infrequently. Um, so that's just super awesome. And you, you do get to enjoy it a lot more. I think um, there's also a mindset too, when you're like, I'm doing this for three days or whatever it is that the idea of finishing is a little bit less in your head so that you're just kind of like, I'm out here and I'm enjoying it. Whereas Fuji, yeah, was like, you, I knew I had to get to that finish line before dark and I was just hauling ass up there to go as quickly as I can. It's kind of like there's days when I've had a job that I knew was going to be like 16 hours. And when you step in there, you're just go in with that mentality of like, this is never going to end. And yeah. it almost seems shorter than when you know you have to be somewhere for six hours. Um, yeah, it's a completely different thing. Um, you know, it's not like you're going anywhere. Um, but I mean, if, if I could recommend to anyone that was planning on doing, take as long as you possibly can do, don't do the Coca-Cola route, do, do the cool routes like Le Moshe or, um, or uh, Marengo, no, not Marengo, Marengo is a Coca-Cola route. Anyway, man, too too much information in my brain right now. No, um, but Le Morsha, there's actually routes um, on the northern side of the mountain which very few people go, and you can get operators. It. Um, my wife's just correcting me on the on the routes. Um, <laughs> the the northern side of of Kili is untouched. There's wildlife in the in the rainforests, um, and very few people climb from that side. And so there's adventure to be had there. That is very unique, and uh, you, you can find operators that operate and, and take people up on that side of the mountain, which is the way to do it. Really, is there and any interesting can, wildlife that you that you see there? Yeah, uh, yeah, not really. I mean, they've got a, a couple of primate species. They've got black and white colobus and, and blue monkey in the rainforest. There's some nice turaco birds. Um, there's some indigenous, uh, endemic, semi-endemic bird species. There's endemic um, uh, plant species. So there's cool things, um, but certainly from a while, if you climb Mount Meru, uh, you essentially work, walking through a national park. So you can encounter elephants and buffalo and uh, all kinds really? of things going up. Yeah. So that's quite a cool one to do. Um, but what, yeah. What country is Meru in? It's in Tanzania. In Tanzania. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that yeah. sounds amazing. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between, like we talked about the process of going out on safari. How about when you're, when you're guiding a trip up to go see the, the gorillas? Yeah, um, you know the the gorilla situation. I think is a is quite a unique tourism situation because um, depending on where you're going, of course, there, there's three countries where you could opt for. So you've got Rwanda, you've got Uganda, and you've got the Congo. Um, there's other places to see the different species, uh, which is the the western um, lowland gorillas. So you can get that in CAR, but no mm -hmm. one's going to to the CAR anytime soon, I don't think. Yeah. Um, so you're left with those three options, and um, so starting with Rwanda is an incredibly organized, beautiful, amazing, mind altering country, you know, especially after their, their recent political history, everyone goes in there with a specific preconceived notion about what it's like. Right. And then you go there and you just completely swept aside by just how magnificent the people are, the country is, um, and they're incredibly organized when it comes to guerrilla tourism, especially, um, so in Rwanda, I think they've got in excess of 24, 26 families of gorillas up on the, so it's, it's all on the Virunga Massive, which is the, the mountain range that covers those three countries. So you're just accessing essentially the same mountain gorillas, yeah. uh, just from different, different countries and different sides, different mountains. Um, so Rwanda is incredibly organized. Um, you're going to get your the permits are very, very expensive now. They recently they they doubled their their permit price to thousand five hundred dollars per permit, um, and they've done it for a specific reason. They want less traffic for the gorillas with the same monetary benefit for the country right. kind of thing. That's cool. So we'll see. Yeah, we'll see how that works out because it's it's a, it's a very niche market you're dealing with. Yeah. Uh, when you get up into that rarefied cost bracket. Um, so, uh, but it's fantastic. Like, uh, many, I think there's something very unique about being so close to, to animals that have such a, a huge percentage of our own DNA. Yeah. When you, when you're there and you're sitting with them there, there's something very visceral about the experience. Like you, you, you look in their eyes and you can see 
a counterpart. Uh, there's something that's very, very different to other wildlife experiences in that in that aspect. Um, and you can you can get very close. You, I mean, the habituated families are, are almost, I say almost, um, ambivalent to your presence. Sometimes, like this year, I had a, a young youngster that got uh, a fright. There was two two sub adults fighting over some food, and the young males are just like young humans. They are full of testosterone and don't know where to put it. Um, so it assumed that the noise was coming from us, and he came straight through. Uh, the stinging nettles pushed them, pushed them all down, and then absolutely temp and bolt all of us. Like just the the power and the strength of them is just unbelievable. Real, so wait, he hit, he, yeah. did he hit anybody? Yeah, yeah, he, he came charging through. Now the guides are incredibly good; they see this every day. There's no there's no risk to you. They're just yeah. being boisterous. And but the strength is something that took me completely by surprise. It shoved me, just one handed sort of push off, and wow. I flew off into really? the undergrowth. Um, and then he temp and bolted, he shoved the, the guy behind me um, and then ran through all of my, my guests um, until we were all flat on the ground. And then he came around the back and, and one of the, the guests got up. Uh, and as she got up, uh, the gorilla sort of stamped her on the side of her leg. Like, don't. Oh, my God. Um, and, it, and it's not in a, uh, an incredibly aggressive way. Yeah, but and Maybe the story sounds like that, but it's not really. It's kind of like jovial playfulness kind of right. in with a little bit more of a, a serious twist, but there's no real danger to you. And that's, almost, that's almost the whole because point. he kind of knows like I can completely own yeah. these humans. I'm so much yeah, well, stronger. Like, what them. are you going to do? Like, come on, <laughs> really, what are you going to do? Um, and the other thing is, is that, you know, if it was the, it was a sub adult male, um, which clearly dominated us. But if you can imagine that situation, if that was a silverback, I mean, that's terrifying. Oh, that's yeah. a terrifying situation. And then if you read back to to before the days when all of these these families were completely habituated to humans, people had to go up there and habituate. It didn't just happen, you know. They, right. It took a lot of effort to get these families habituated, and they they were not comfortable with humans. And then you would have the silverbacks reacting because they need to protect their troop and and uh, and their family, and they and they will actively do that. So the habituators back in the day had a seriously rough time because there were certain silverbacks that um, had a complete dislike for, for for human beings and it took them years and years to to get them to settle down. And the silverbacks would just come in and ragdoll you, man. They'll just, I mean, ragdoll is an understatement. Yeah. Uh, you know? So back in those days, it was, it was certainly more than it is now. Now they're ambivalent. And, and that's the thing with this youngster coming through. The silverback lifts up his head and has a look over and he's like, ah. <laughs> youngsters you know is there a uh, is there a population of those gorillas that are still unhabituated like is there a sense of like how many of those families regularly see human traffic versus don't yeah so i'm going to uh, speak in generalizations again so yeah stop the the, the googling exact numbers but <laughs> um essentially the population has increased very impressively. So the, the mountain gorilla species has uh, increased from about 750 to over a thousand now. So it's maybe closer to a thousand one hundred individuals. Mm -hmm. And because it's so localized in the in that Virunga massive area, um, it's a it's a it should be lauded as a as a conservation success story. So I mean, I would guess that um, probably over half would be habituated. Okay. So uh, a normal a normal uh, family group size might be anywhere from eight to to twenty. Oh wow! Um, so if you know, if Rwanda's got twenty twenty four or twenty six habituated families, and they're still habituating others, that it's a it's a fairly substantial portion that are habituated. Chimps, on the other hand, are vastly different. Chimps, um, the percentage of habituated chimps are very very minuscule. Really? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where are you typically uh, seeing chimps? Okay, so there's countries? a. Um, Tanzania um, and uh, Uganda are the two best places to view them. Um, and then chimps are found throughout Western Africa. So uh, Central and West Africa, they're fairly, fairly, well, I wouldn't say they're common. They're, they're definitely not common, but um, they're fairly widespread. Mm -hmm. uh, but the percentages of habituated troops, uh, or not troops, uh, habituated family groups are, are very, very small. And they only occur in the areas where they've been researched. So um, in Uganda, it's Kabali National Park. And Kabali um, has a very, very strong population of, of chips. It's in excess of 1,000. But I think if 100 of those or less, 
probably less are habituated it's a lot so that's 10 that's percent cool. is not very much yeah um gombe stream that's where uh, uh jane goodall was doing her research um there's a, a very sizable population of chimps again a small portion is, is habituated in Mah- uh, mahali national park in tanzania again there's more chimps outside of mahali national park than inside they reckon there's about a thousand inside mm-hmm. um and the habituated group is like less than 80 oh my god generally speaking yeah, so the percentage is a lot smaller for chimps. That's cool. But then like also that. for the for the other the other gorilla species, um, the lowland species, um, they're much more numerous. So they're still endangered or threatened, near threatened, threatened. Um, but the the population that is habituated is very small in comparison to the mount because they're fairly widespread. They go all the way um, through Central and West Africa, all the way to almost to the coast to areas like Gabon and, and things like that. Oh, I'm surprised. I would have thought it was the opposite because the lowland gor- gorillas get more interaction with like habitat loss and stuff. Yeah, there's uh, there's habitat loss. But remember, the areas that we're talking about are so immense. I mean, if you just talk about a country like uh, the DRC, mm-hmm. um, the areas are just so immense and so unpopulated and wild. Uh, you know, you would expect that there'd be wild populations of animals there, you know, fairly yeah. routinely. Yeah. It, and is the experience of seeing a chimp similar to the gorilla? Yeah, no, it's a different thing. Uh, gorillas tend to be quite sedate. Their, their personalities are, are very different. So um, even if you look at the intelligence of, of, of great apes, uh, gorillas are, have a, a completely different intelligence sector. And, you know, like now we are only starting to understand our own different types of intelligence um, as far as emotional intelligence and things right. like that go. It's very similar in apes. So gorilla has a very specific type of empathetic intelligence. Um, so they're not as political as chimps. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Chimps are uh, – gorillas don't do as well uh, in uh, cognitive tests as chimps do. Um, so chimps have a more cognitive intelligence than gorillas do, but gorillas have a more emotional intelligence than chimps do. Um, oh, I had no idea. Yeah, so those two are very, very different. So the the experience is very different. The, the gorilla experience is quite sedate, mostly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you get them when they – so you get them normally mid-morning, and they're napping, chilling out. You can sit in the – Silverback's lying on his back grooming. You're sitting next to him. No, no drama. Everything's chilled. With chimps – they're noisy, active, wild, just constantly moving. It's, <laughs> it's chaos. Like the hour, an hour with the chimps is, is chaotic. Um, really? Okay, cool. Yeah. They're, they're fairly chaotic. You know, they can be sedate from time to time, but generally it's fairly chaotic. That's interesting. Um, I've, never, I've never heard of the intelligence really? thing talked about that. Yeah. Way. I mean, just as a conversation, you could talk about great ape intelligence for 50 years, you, you wouldn't be broaching the topic, you know, it's a, it's a crazy thing. Yeah. But it's a, it's a, it's a wild experience. It's super awesome. Why do you do what you do? <clears throat> I think just the, um, what it gives me, if you, you know, look at it, like from a selfish perspective, because that's, I suppose the reason why anybody does anything, um, yeah. what, what I get back from doing what I do makes it all worthwhile. Um, I could not live my life without doing what I do. It's part of me. It's intrinsic. I have to do it because if I don't, I'm just denying a part of myself. Um, I have to. And the more that you do it, the more you seek it out. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like it's, it's like a a drug in that way. It's like you have to fulfill that need. Like now I tend to try and push myself out into more wilderness areas. I want to see really authentic wilderness. I want to see um, unique animals, unique birds, unique uh, ecosystems. So you scratch the surface. And I think one of the reasons that I do it is you can be constantly entertained. You, you, mm-hmm. you It's never dull. You, um, There's always something to explore. There's always something to learn. There's always the motivation to, to learn, um, always the motivation to be humbled. Like, you know, Africa – in general, uh, obviously, I'm not expanding outwards to the world's wilderness areas, but Africa is a unique ability to really give you a slap upside the head and say, listen, whatever you thought you were, bring it down a notch. <laughs> cool. You know? Yeah, um, no, definitely. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, all of those reasons, I think, but from a purely selfish reason, I think uh, just w- w- the reward I get from it just 
just by seeing the most amazing things is just completely worth it. In in a world that's getting completely or consistently more urbanized and people seemingly feeling more and more disconnected from the natural world, why is wildlife important? Like, I think a lot of times, I mean, I probably interact with wildlife very minimally on a day-to-day basis. Um, why does it matter outside of just seeing nice photos? Yeah, I mean, I think that's an excellent question. And I think it's got an excellent answer as well. I think, um, so if you expand it outwards, I don't think you need to narrow it down just to wildlife. But um, my first answer is, is that we are wildlife. We are animals. And the more that you try and deny that, the, the further you get down that road, the sooner you're going to come back to the very beginning and to the fact that we are actually animals. Um, and animals require other animals to exist. That's just how it is. We eat them. That's one thing. We don't have to eat them. We can eat plants, I suppose. But we have pets. We need animals in our life. So we need, more importantly, we need nature in our lives. Because I think um, it's very difficult to uh, look into or investigate people that live in nature that are unhappy. Uh, traditional cultures uh, that have a, a, a vastly more simple lifestyle to our own are vastly happier than we could ever imagine. Um, and you see that when you're out there. You uh, you look at it and you say, these people have nothing. They, they don't have running water. They don't have a uh, flushing toilet. They uh, have very basic they're, they're Maslow, they're on the, the bottom rung of the, of the hierarchy of needs, yet they're happier. And I can guarantee you, aside from the hardships of their life, emotionally, they are far happier than we are. Um, and I believe that, I really, really do. And I think a lot to do with, or that has a lot to do with, with their interaction with nature. I feel like we are part of an ecosystem. Um, and we can't remove ourselves from that. If we remove ourselves from that ecosystem, we just, well, I don't know what we're achieving. We're not achieving anything. I think it's, it's, uh, it's critical for our mindsets. It's critical for our mental health, our physical health. Um, I think it, nature is everything. Um, and I don't think you can deny it. I don't think you can refuse your self nature. I think that might be my favorite answer. I've gotten to that question just thus far. Okay, good. I'm glad. If you could put a billboard on the side of a highway that disseminated one message in 10 words or less, what would that message be? Go outside. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, I often think that's, um, just, just go outside. I think like, um, you know, and uh, when I say outside, I mean, just go into nature. Like that's, I think everybody will find something they enjoy I even agree. if it's drink, drinking drinking a beer and watching a sunset man like that's hard to beat huh? I, I always say like every once in a while I start getting like day after day of this overwhelming anxiety and I'm just like weirdly like angry for no apparent reason I'm like oh yeah I haven't left the city in a minute and then I go outside and head out to like the desert or go up into the mountains and I'm like okay I'm recalibrated I can go back I think I honestly think that's so true. Uh, I mean, I know it, I, I speak from personal experience in this. Like, it really is. Uh, if 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 I don't have that, um, I will break down. I will I will melt down. It's just not possible. And and I might need it more than other people need it. But I think everybody needs it. Everybody needs to 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 go out and and just have grass between their toes or whatever. I agree, and I think that's a yeah. a great place to. To wrap this up, thank you so much, Keith. I'm really efficient. appreciate thank you taking you. the time. Um, like I said, I'm a huge fan of your work. Where, where can people check it out? Like, uh, I know the website, and I'll link everything in the show notes. But I'm not sure if you had That's anything awesome. else in particular. Um, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a, maybe a bit of a, a, a social slacker at the moment. I've, I've fallen off the Instagram wagon, but uh, you can get me on Instagram, Ingwe nine one one. What does that so stand for? I, it's a, it's a Bantu for leopard. Oh, so, cool. Yeah, I-N-G-W-E-911? 911. Um, uh, that's on Instagram, and then you can get me on, on Facebook. Um, just check me out on Facebook. Um, yeah, and then the website. That's pretty much how I roll. Awesome. And what can people expect over the, the next five years? What's What's to come? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's just more of the same, eh? Um, just getting out there and showing showing people what's what uh, what Africa is about. I think there's just so much to explore. I, I hope I can uh, take some more cool photos and see some more cool stuff. So that's it. Well, Keith, thank you so much. I am a huge fan again and really appreciate your time. And to everybody else, until next time, stay wild. Thank you so much for listening. I honestly cannot express how much I appreciate you taking the time for all information regarding this episode's guest, social channels, books, how you can support, etc. Please check out our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please, please, please subscribe to the podcast. We are everywhere that you can find podcasts. Subscribe to Escape the Zoo on YouTube, follow Escape the Zoo on Instagram, like Escape the Zoo on Facebook, and please share with your friends. It honestly goes so far and means so much to me. And lastly, if you'd like to be emailed with each new podcast and any other major Escape the Zoo updates, visit escapethezoo.tv and sign up for our email list. Thank you.